Hey, welcome back to Garbro's Field Desk. I have for you Chapter 3 of the Veil Riders Book 1, Redo Mark 2. Like, subscribe, comment down below, join the Discord. Let's get on with it. Chapter 3 Eye to Eye with Mythos The formation of humans walked in a staggered infantry column down a well-cut dirt road, their wide variety of boots crunching on the gravel as they moved. They had decided while en route to the village to perhaps not spook them by walking up and out of the forest all of a sudden and instead take a more direct and open approach down a road they knew existed thanks to the labors of Gremlin. While one human had their suspicion of germs and possible fantasy diseases, Yule and Coco didn't really have a worry in that regard. To them, it was more than likely these people, or the people of this land, had many ways to cure the ill and any kind of sickness that may arise. After all, these were elves. They weren't walking into a kobold stronghold or something of that sort, or getting shot with shit-covered arrows. Yet. As far as Yule was concerned, it was actually quite nice going for a walk after being cooped up in Fort Kickass for all these weeks, and to hear the wind rustling through the leaves of trees was bringing back memories of Oklahoma. While Yule and some of the other humans walked with rifles low and enjoying the overall ambiance, others walked at the low ready. As if expecting dire wolves to lunge out of the woods that surrounded them on each side and drag their body into the brush for a snack. Yule told the volunteers while on the way out that they needed to be as calm as possible and walk as if there wasn't a threat. The last thing he wanted was for the elves to perceive that they were stalking along the road and not actually walking out to greet them and make contact. So what are we going to do when we make contact with these elves anyway? Gabriel asked, both he, Chix, and Domino having bullied their way into the approach group. Are we going to have tea together and try to broker a trade deal or something? There was a snort from down the line and a voice piped up from the formation. Gabriel's out here thinking he's playing Civilization or something. I'm just saying. Gabriel muttered, holding out a hand and gesturing down the road. We're on a fantasy planet, obviously. We make contact with these elves. Then what? Chicks blew, then popped a bubble before smiling brightly. The obvious answer is interspecies relations! There were a few whistles down the line, as well as a few pained groans of annoyance, and Yule turned around, walking backwards as he spoke. There will be no interspecies relations going on during this patrol. We are going to make contact and try to explain to them that we are not a threat, Yule stated, then turned back around to continue walking normally. Chicks blew another bubble, then bared her teeth. Ah, <sighs> buzzkill. Leave it to the blonde to immediately focus her brain on getting some elf dick. Grouch called out from the line, and another man named Boone laughed beside him. Ain't nothing wrong with wanting to see how the locals perform. Kentucky said with a sultry sway of her hips, making Mullen grimace from behind her. Could you not wag that fried chicken maker in my direction? Thanks. Mullen growled, then recoiled out into the road to avoid Kentucky as she stopped mid-step, bending over at the waist. Yule half-turned, clapping his hands angrily. Children, please, on mission. Hours passed on in relative serenity after that. Conversation staying low, much to the relief of both Coco and Yule. Yule began to notice a severe lack of traffic on the road. A lot of the wagon ruts and runs were extremely old, with very little new tread or marks on the surface at all. He pocketed that information in the back of his head, as ahead of them were a few scattered outer buildings that seemed to be just beyond the edge of the trees. Yule sniffed, flicked his rifle over his shoulder, but still keeping his M9 well at hand and off safe. Smiles engaged people, let's not cause a ruckus and spook the locals. 
The humans walked out into the sun past the tree line, the brightly colored insects buzzing about them and then flying away from their approach onto the open road to the village. It took a matter of minutes for the elves of the village to become highly aware of their presence, Yul thinking it more a town in scope now that he was closer. Well, that wasn't entirely true, since it was mostly just one elf that became highly aware of their presence. The second building they passed had a little girl sitting outside near a very ornate wooden gate, and a large golden colored dog was in front of her. She was cooing at it in her language and the dog seemed to be soaking up the attention, its tail wagging and tongue lolling out happily. The dogs here were odd, and Yule thought they looked more like a maned wolves with their long legs and odd colorings. When she looked up, she locked eyes with Yule, who had walked within ten yards of her with the five humans who had slinked up around him for a better look. The little elf girl tilted her head and Yule took his hat off, giving a slight bow to the girl as loose strands of his curly hair came down across his forehead. Yule usually kept his hair tied back with a string of leather so the curly mass wouldn't blind him every time he bent over to grab something but had forgotten to do so this morning. The dog growled at the strange smelling men and women, but the little elf girl quickly smooshed the dog's cheeks with her palms and talked to it in a stern manner. When she was sure the dog wasn't going to rip off the strange man's leg, she hopped up and politely bowed back to Yule. Yule smiled, and the little elf girl smiled back. Yule couldn't help but chuckle a little. It was so odd seeing an actual honest-to-God elf in real life. Their flesh, for the most part, looked just like his. She had little freckles on her face, and her eyes had just the slightest almond shape to them. My God, that is an elf. I would never have thought I'd be meeting one, seeing one, hell, being before one. Oh, she has little freckles. Kentucky said in breathy amazement, while behind her, Grouch leaned forward, squinting his eyes. I'd have thought their ears would be shorter. She has some long ones, must be at least a foot long, he said, then reached down and pulled on Kentucky's ears, making them stick out. The little girl laughed happily, then pinched the ends of her own ears and mimicked the movement. Oh yeah, at least a foot. Kentucky murmured, then turned her head quickly and caught Grouch's knuckles with her teeth. Grouch hissed and jerked his hand away. Ow! God damn it, woman! The calm was broken by the sound of breaking pottery, and the formation's eyes snapped up to see Mama Elf standing in the doorway, the floor of which looked to be covered in some kind of pinkish water and shattered vessel. There was a long pause, the little elf girl looking from Yule to her mother, while the dog, sensing the tension, loudly lapped at his genitals. The two elves shared the same amber honey eye color and flaxen yellow hair. Their cheeks also sported the same sprinkling of sun-kissed freckles that rippled down to the tops of their shoulders, disappearing under the necklines of well-made and expertly cut summer wear. Their clothes spoke of hard-earned function, sparing very little for grandeur and sophistication, and only the barest forms of decoration poked out here and there. Flowers of bright thread danced along the bottom hem of the mother's trousers, while the same flowers adorned the little girl's field dress. Both wore a kind of soft leather vest that protected their upper torsos. It was not battle-worthy in any way, but really brought the entire outfit together in a fashion that made Yule think of western wear. Chicks, despite the obvious tension, trotted up, popped her head around the gate, and gave her best cheery smile and wave. Hi! Everyone's eyes snapped to Chicks, who gave a nervous chuckle and slowly bent her fingers down, shrinking slightly from the number of gazes being pointed her way. The little elf girl waved back and mimicked chicks with her own Hi. showing a lot of teeth as she did. All the female volunteers cooed and awed at her, while the rest of the male volunteers were wondering where Papa Bear was in all this, and if he was sneaking up on them with a spear in his hand. The mother elf made no moves but glared at the humans and kept motioning for her daughter to come inside. 
You will saw that they didn't attack on first contact, but could tell from the worry lines on the female elf's face that they were stressing her out from being so near her kid. He raised a hand and made ushering motions near his hip. Let's move on, before the elf mama decides to cast a spell on us. The humans gave a short chorus of nervous laughs before the formation began moving onwards down the road and one of the volunteers near the rear set down a small pack of dehydrated coffee and a protein bar near the gate of the home. When the last volunteer was well away, the older elf ran out and snatched her daughter up like a hawk, dragging her inside and leaving the dog to sniff curiously at the small packages the foreigners left behind. I don't want to worry you guys, Yule began, looking over his shoulder at the home behind them, but this may have been a stupid idea. Mullen snorted. Of course this is a stupid idea. Why do you think we wanted to come along? Any elf with an eye shot of the formation of humans stopped what they were doing and watched them. While some took off at a sprint to their homes, others walked up in curiosity to get a better look. After all, these strange beings were not being outwardly aggressive and were waving at them in a friendly manner. After passing the first house-filled area, the humans became surrounded by elves who stood back at distance in groups, talking in their language to each other and pointing. When a human would wave, they would wave back and smile, then go back to talking to their friends excitedly. The formation strode right into the middle of the town, coming to a halt where a small fountain and park resided. The humans behind Yule and Coco were quietly thinking of ways to get back at Yule in case something went wrong, and they happened to survive getting mobbed by a bunch of fantasy creatures. The villagers of this elf town had made a large ring around them and were talking very busily amongst themselves, and the vibe was odd to say the least. Coco had made sure to get as many human language speakers as possible in this group, in case there was a shared language, but none of them were picking up on what these elves were speaking. Alright, trying to avoid looking scary. Be like the penguins, boys, smile and wave. Yule murmured, raising his hand and waving at a small group of men who were clutching spears in their hands, the points looking wicked and glinting in the sunlight or else we may end up getting stabbed. Domino flashed an easy smile and winked at the elves, leaning in towards Yule. I swear to fuck, if we end up dead on our first contact, I'm gonna haunt you to no end. The other humans who got the reference glanced at Yule, almost annoyed, but still did their best to smile and wave at anyone they could. The female volunteers were awestruck by the amount of pretty men in the crowd, while the males were quite pleased to see the mythos about elven maidens and their beauty was indeed true. Yule told the group to take a knee and rest while he and Coco remained standing. Yule looked over to Coco, checking his watch. How long till the chief or mayor shows up, you think? Probably as soon as he puts on his favorite necktie. Coco said with a bright smile and stood on his tiptoes, trying to peer around for a split in the crowd but found none. Hey, quit giving away your shit. We don't know if we'll need that here soon. Yule barked at a human trying to hand away an entire MRE and threw his hat at him to get his attention. This is an elf village, not a mountain hamlet in Afghanistan, I. Right? Coco leaned to the side and smacked another man on the shoulder as he had been leaning forward with his own hand to take an elven woman's. Touch an elf and I'll leave that hand here as a memento. For the most part, the interaction was going okay. The elves were doing a lot of pointing and behind the hand talking, while the humans were openly winking and flirting with just about anything that had a bodice or their clavicles showing. It was around the time Chix was taking selfies with a group of male elves that the apparent governor was making his way towards them, surrounded by what looked like a guard retinue. All right, say cheese! Chix said happily, glowing in the glory of the moment. She had three of them bending down behind her, and a great gale of laughter erupted when she turned her head and kissed one of the men on the cheek. The elf leaned backwards, laughing and blushing while Yule nearly came unglued at the seams. Chicks, for fuck's sake, stop kissing the fucking elves! 
Yule roared, and was winding back to throw a pistol magazine at her when Coco nudged him with a hard elbow to the ribs. Yule grunted, then turned, narrowing his eyes as he spied the crowd parting. The honor guard was wearing a strange form of intricate Lalimer armor that looked very silvery instead of the usual tint of steel, and deep maroon gamisons underneath that armor. Curiously, they wore simple soft hats that were cocked to the side in a rakish fashion and a skirt of plates with trousers underneath. They carried simple spears and a triangle-shaped shield that seemed to be far more for fashion than a workhorse. But with elven craftsmanship, there's no telling what kind of stuff they shoved inside that wood to make it stronger. These motherfuckers got some style, Yule murmured, tipping his hat back while Coco whistled and clapped at the guards. Real shame their knife ears, though. Coco retorted and ran his fingers along his ears while grinning wolfishly at them. The elven guards smirked at the clapping and gestures, and their eyes crinkled with humor. Some things just translated seamlessly between soldiers, no matter where they were from. The governor opened his arms in welcome to Yule and Coco, speaking to them in his native elven language. The two commanders held their hands over their ears and shook their heads slightly in response and made riding motions with their hands. The governor seemed crestfallen for a minute before putting back on his smile and waving them over to a slightly smaller building near the inn. The troop of volunteers walked behind their co-commanders, who walked beside the governor, whose own guard walked behind him. The governor was pointing out things to Yule and Coco, who politely looked and made appreciative noises when he pointed out something particularly pretty or some kind of architecture. Yule looked over his shoulder when he had a chance and saw Domino and a few other troopers offering the elves a candy size from their MREs. Chix was also taking more selfies with a rather handsome guard, who stared in fascination at his own face as dog ears popped onto his head. Hey, hey, stop it! Psst, stop! Yule whispered furiously, waving his hand as discreetly as he could. Knock that shit off! The humans snapped back into place, but as soon as Yule had turned around, one of the elven guards held out his hand, and Domino plopped more brightly colored spheres into it. The walk to the governor's building was short, and the crowd of elves slowly followed the entire time, chattering to themselves. The interior of the building was lavish and spartan at the same time. There were no silken curtains or velvet cushions, but a lot of carpenter-made furniture and simple chairs or seats. What made it lavish was the amount of work that went into the design and carvings of almost everything in the room. From the large desk that lay scattered with papers to the little side table in the corner, everything had what seemed like hours upon hours of finely detailed and intricate carving done onto every surface, except the areas that were supposed to be the seat or tabletop. Only Yule and Coco walked inside, while the rest of the humans waited outside and schmoozed with the crowd. If their goal was to build a good rapport with the locals, they were certainly going to make a solid crack at it. The governor sighed happily and clapped his hands together, raising his eyebrows at both of the human commanders. The governor himself was a very slight man, but still had a bit of a pudgy appearance around the middle despite his elvish nature. Yule noted that with a smile, seeing as to how no matter what race you seem to be, people in high places seem to fall victim to the spare tire of authority. Yule held his hand out to the elf while pointing with his other hand at himself. Yule, I'm Yule. The elf took his hand and gave it a little shake, while chuckling happily that Yule introduced himself without too much prompting. Yule then pointed at Coco. I'm Coco. Coco said with a smile he put every ounce of charm he had into and held at his hand. As soon as the elf took his hand, the boyish delight of shaking hands with a mythical creature poured across his face like a mask. The elven governor placed both of his hands upon his chest, his ruffled cuffs shaking slightly as he did. Respin. El Alori Respin. Yule and Coco pointed at the elf, both saying, Respin, at the same time. The elf gestured at them. 
Yule, Coco. Coco and Yule bowed forwards to him, and the elf bowed back. After that, the group began to try and communicate via drawings, while also showing the governor the maps that they had brought with. The governor began to slowly draw out the village's name, a script neither of the humans could read, and also what they seemed to grow. The elven governor drew up what looked like wheat, potatoes, a long-looking carrot, and a few other kinds of produce that they couldn't draw a parallel to. The elf then drew horses and furniture, which they both assumed was some kind of manufacturing clue to what they made here as well. The elf then handed them the quill, and the two of them did their best to scrawl their story. The cave, their world, who they were, what they were here for, etc. Their pensmanship looked like a newborn writing with its mouth in comparison, but the elven governors seemed to have gotten the general idea of who they were. They were at this for almost an hour when Yule peeked outside through the window, seeing his troopers lounging around and playing with the local elves. One thing in particular he saw made him jerk open the window and bellow down to those below. Get that weapon out of her hands before I come down there and kick in your skull. Down below, a male human had let a female elf hold his rifle, showing her how it worked and what the ammunition looked like. Something that Yule simply could not abide. There was some laughter behind Yule, and as he pulled his head away from the window and closed it, he turned to see Coco offering the governor some retort coffee. Yule sighed in exasperation, placing his hands on his hips. Oh, come on, man. We have no idea how they'll handle caffeine. Daylight began to just dip over the horizon when the formation of humans began to walk back down the road on the way to Fort Kickass a lot of them laden with the fruits of their visit. While Yule was furious with them for doing it, the volunteers had managed to somehow trade with the locals, and now their pockets or day packs were stuffed with bread, baked goods, and bottles of alcohol that smelled a lot like wine. Yule also had to double check and make sure all of them still had their weapons, as they had been showing the locals what they were and even let some of them hold the damn things, even after Yule had yelled at them. Coco and Yule learned a lot from the governor during their visit, as he had taken the time between sips of coffee to show Yule and Coco his own maps, which outlined all the other towns and cities that they were not aware of. Thankfully, they had been dropped off in a rather sparsely populated area, but it seemed the further north they went, the more races and cities that cropped up. So far, after the elf drew them to the best of his ability, there were more elven varieties, some kind of beast people, something that had horns, and what appeared to be orcish-like races all over the place and were scattered around in some semblance of territories. What raised even more questions was that there didn't seem to be any humans at all, or at least the elf didn't know of any. Later on, when the first contact team members were walking up the little dugout path to the first trench network, they were joined by one of the collection details Yule had set up before they had gone out to see the elves. Got all your wormies and leafies? Yule asked, taking off his cap and slapping it on his hand. A male volunteer held up a jar and gave it a little wiggle, showing off a peeve-looking barbed insect inside of it. Yes, Mr. Yule. It's quite startling how similar yet different everything is around here. Just enough to make you think of something back home, but still way too weird to be the same thing. The rest of the volunteers held up their own containers that had been sent through the veil earlier with a mortar. Inside were tubes of soil samples, leaves taken from trees, earthworms, insects, and even a live mouse they had managed to capture. The mouse had some kind of rock ballad mohawk, but other than that looked like a regular mouse to Yule. Yule thumped his pack down near his hooch while the others began sharing their goods with the other volunteers, regaling them with stories about the town and the elves that lived there. Chix was showing off her pictures as well and had quite the crowd gathered around her as she scrolled through, showing them what the townsfolk looked like. Gremlin walked up to Yule, patting him on the shoulder to get his attention, and he turned. She handed him a stack of papers, her eyes sporting their usual dark rings. One as high as I could today. 
Seems this place is just under or over twice the size of our Earth if the numbers are correct. But I am not that good at math. She said shortly, tapping the papers with her slender fingers. Regardless, I attempted to do the math, and something must be going on with it. Gravity doesn't seem to be any stronger. Yay. Yule groaned and slapped the papers down onto his little earth and wood field desk. He plopped down into his whole home, leaned back onto his bundled wool blanket, and dug into the pile of folders next to him. He picked out one and flipped through it, running his finger down a timeline. Eggheads should be showing up here in about a month, but something tells me this schedule is only worth its weight as ass tissue. Why do you say that? Gremlin asked, squatting down beside Yule's hooch. Is it because of the time thing Coco was talking about? Maybe. Yule said with a shrug, then pulled out another folder. I've also been looking under orders. They seem in line and simple, but I'm not so sure anymore. Gremlin leaned forward on her heels, raising her eyebrows as she peered down at the open folder in Yule's hands. You mean how we're supposed to be a beachhead and prep the area for more people? Yeah, Yule said, but snapped the folder shut and tossed it down onto the little piece of lumber masquerading as a desk. The only issue is, I was holding this folder yesterday and a few of the papers were blank. Now they're not. Gremlin chuckled. (laughs) I think you just need to get more sleep, big man. You've been running around the entire time, worrying about stuff too much and letting it all go to your head. You've probably been looking at those papers so much, you went eye blind. Gremlin then reached down and rustled Yule's hair, but Yule jerked his head away with a growl and sunk back onto his wool blanket, crossing his arms as he began to go over the details of the day. The following morning, the next wave of volunteers arrived, a complement of 60 more men and women who brought more supplies in with them as well. These troopers arrived a full week early, which did confirm the findings that Cole and Coco had pushed forward, and the new arrivals were shocked to hear that they were, in fact, early. They also brought with them a pair of U.S. government scientists who raged and threatened Yule with jail time for daring to come into contact with anything local. Think of the damage you could have done. You could have inadvertently given them all kinds of infectious diseases from our planet. What if you caught some kind of rare elf cold? The oak stock of a man in front of Yule fumed while Yule bemusedly sucked on a cigar and blew smoke out of his nose. He took the scientist by the shoulders and slowly spun him until he was looking at the gigantic direwolf pelt that adorned the makeshift roof over Gremlin's computing station, someone having stuck a stick in its giant maw so it stayed open and exposed the huge fangs for all to see. A cold is by far the least of this world's worries, egghead. After that, they tried to speak only to Coco and would refuse to talk to Yule due to how he treated them. They collected their samples and sent them back through the veil on an almost daily basis and would constantly bemoan the living conditions of Fort Kickass. The scientists' first issue was that they had to sleep on the ground, as the volunteers around them quickly stole their fancy cots and they had to resort to sleeping on ground mats. The second issue was the lack of toilets, and the scientists outright refused to use the pooping log, instead running out into the woods to dig their own latrine. This backfired immediately when they were chased out of the woods by a cat that looked much like a Pokemon bristling with spines and yowling angrily. It took some time, but eventually they settled for the far safer pooping log. They were mostly ignored by the volunteers, but the news told by the fresh volunteers from the other side of the Vale was not. According to them, the rest of the countries were putting an inordinate amount of pressure on the United States, which was causing the entire country to become jittery. It was also coming under harassment from the UN as well, which was making the internet fly with conspiracy theories so lavish that it almost seemed like the Cold War had come back to haunt the minds of Americans. 
Due to this, the US military was bolstering every strategic location they could, and this was causing a major drain on manpower that they were wanting to send over to replace the volunteer Vale militia. A few days later Veil vale time, news came that the samples taken from the New World were indicators of it being resource laden and would be a major power component for the US which caused every country with a magical background to jump around and try to find their own hidden door to the veil. All it took was some rock samples being mineral rich in the tales of elves, and now every country had a target firmly painted on coal country. Hoping to keep their nest eggs safe, the US military was giving the volunteers in the veil even more toys to play and fortify with. A few more veil days after the news came, the portal inside the cave became a flurry of activity as more weapons, supplies, and a complement of ATVs and dirt bikes arrived. The fuel to feed them being strapped onto every surface a ratchet strap and bungee cord could hook. Living the Mad Max life was a term used a lot over the next week, and metal became the new standard of music that blared out of phones and digital stereos right alongside the usuals. Things were going quite swimmingly, everything considered, as the elves came to visit a few times and were shown around the base. The scientists raved the entire while about how the volunteers were going to kill them with human bacteria. Look. Look at that! They should not be consuming energy drinks! One of the female scientists bawled, her hands clutching at her hair as a volunteer shared a multicolored can with a male elf. It's going to kill him! Another male scientist was actually trying to yank away the arm of Wolf, who was nearly three times his size at the bicep, in order to keep him from giving a female elf a snack cake. Absolutely not! No! The artificial dyes and corn syrup will be enough to kill her outright. Much to their aggravation, the only thing that happened was a child puking after being given too many sweets. Despite their doom and gloom, the elves appeared to be made of tougher stuff than realized. These visits usually came in the form of several wagons appearing around the bend of the hills, each laden with both townsfolk and gifts ranging from more wine, beer, ale, bread, and at one time even a cheese of some kind that the humans raved about for days. Yule kept a tight eye on the interactions between his men and women and the elves, and each human knew that Yule would have whipped them into bloody rags if they brought a local to their little tents. Despite Yule's protests, a few were given demonstrations of the weapons, which perked up a lot of elven ears to the power of these strange beings and even stranger clothing. After the visits, the elves would pack up and head home, carrying the tales of the humans with them. One day, a magician came with them, and the woman seemed to bask in the glory of her power as she entertained all the humans around her. Yule saw with narrowed eyes that she had a spiked ring on her thumb and jabbed herself with it to make herself bleed. The scientists nearly lost their minds when the female elf summoned a fireball within her hands, letting it hop between her palms. This is incredible! One of them cried out, pulling out a piece of paper and setting it alight on her little ball of fire. It's... it's real! It burns! The magician followed through pantomime what the scientists wanted her to do. She made the earth move into a little mound, made water swirl through the sky, heated up in cooled down water, and at one point even made a set of rocks explode, hurling a concussive ball at it that erupted with the same force as a mortar shell. The scientists were not seen for hours after locals left, writing up their reports and making voice recordings. Fuel and supplies came steadily, slowly allowing them to build a stockpile in their hill fort, until one day the scientists that had come across the veil decided to check back in person with their own command structure on the other side. They were quite excited to show their findings, and went across with giddy steps of a child knowing a secret. They were obviously tired of sleeping on the ground, their cots kept getting stolen over and over, and shitting in holes they dug themselves, and said they would be back within a day. The Veil Militia walked them in, made sure they went through safely, then waited. The days passed with no signs of the scientists. 
Even more days passed with no signs of the scientists and no more supplies, either. Yule was getting suspicious, as why would they suddenly halt sending them things they clearly needed, such as fuel and ammo? Despite the lack of activity concerning the Vale, the locals continued to visit, and one day brought with them the first other race the humans had laid eyes on. A harpy. It was a male, obviously, and despite the name the locals gave it, the humans all agreed that it was colored like a sparrow and fawned over the creature. The harpy was humanoid and looked completely normal until about mid-bicep or mid-thigh. It was here that the avian quality showed up, the arms feathering out into wings and the legs scaling up until the feet, which were talons like a bird. Their ears were odd as well, formed wide that tapered into a point, yet sported a ring of feathers that appeared to be able to move on their own. Gremlin and Yule took a particular interest in the harpy, as did Coco, and they gestured to the harpy if they could touch and observe him. The harpy, much to the amusement of them all, gestured that he wanted to be paid before they did anything, and they bribed him with candy instead. As the harpy chewed happily on a candy bar, the humans observed that the wings had little digits that looked a lot like scaled, long-nailed fingers, and could flex like a normal finger as well, allowing them to grip things. Most curious was that, despite the feathers, both Gremlin and Coco knew that a creature like this had no way to fly well. There was no feathered tail to act as a rudder, and while they had legs, it was a poor replacement for the dexterity a feathered tail would bring. Yule was of the opinion that the less bird-like they were, the happier he was, and all of them agreed that despite their judgments, the harpy was extremely agile in flight. They watched the harpy soar around the camp, even throwing things like hats at him to catch and found no fault in their dexterity. It was a curious, but enlightening, diversion. The next couple of days, the townsfolk returned with not just the same harpy, but seven others, all sitting perched along the wagons and craning their necks to get a good look at the humans. These harpies were a bit more varied. While there were male and female sparrow harpies, including the same one from before, there was a red-feathered harpy woman that sported long, crest-like hair. Two others looked a lot like the sparrows, but appeared more hawk-like in their colorations and facial structures, their cheeks less round and cheery and more serious, angled like a predator's. These hawk harpies were keen, intelligent beings that were highly observant, politely tapping objects with their wing claws and looking up at the humans, asking permission to handle whatever it was they were tapping. The Jay Harpy, on the other hand, was an absolute nuisance, running around and snatching things out of hands before lunging up into the sky, seeming to revel in the humans or elves running after them while yelling in their languages. You'll observe that most of the Harpies seemed to run on the shorter end, roughly three to five feet in height, and were always slender or athletic in their build. Many of the humans were smitten by the Harpies, except for the Jay and were treated to rides on the ATVs or allowed to sample more eclectic human delicacies, such as peanut butter goo goo clusters. When it was time for the townsfolk to depart, it was a bit of a chore making the humans relinquish their new harpy friends, as well as making the harpies depart from the base, even having to root out a few of them that tried hiding in the crates or under tables. Both the elves and the more responsible humans shared an amicable chuckle as they took control of their charges, and this time the elves left with a few gifts of their own. Bags of candy, canned soda, advanced manual tools, and even a saddle that one of the humans had smuggled in during one of the back and forth trips. A week went by, and finally there was activity from the veil. The one guard inside running out to alert Yule to the coming arrivals. Yule, finally relieved the eggheads were coming back with supplies, began walking towards the cave entrance with a few riflemen in tow to help unload whatever came through. It was, however, with shock that Yule stopped and gripped his pistol with his right hand, the men and women behind him also coming to a screeching halt. Walking out from the cave were ten men, all of which were wearing long coats and a bright blue hat, on the front of which were two letters, U-N. 
And that's the end of chapter three of the book one, Mark II Remake. If you like this story and others like them, be sure to like and subscribe to the channel of Garbro's Field Desk. Comment down below, join the Discord, join the copy, become a member. Members of this channel get sneak peeks of the art, they get uh, teasers for the next chapter, they get discounts when they buy stuff, all kinds of fun stuff. The largest tier of this membership are the, are, are the first shirts. These guys give $50 a month, and we have e Machino, Cody Jiro, Death Dancer, and Insane Medic. These guys have been holding the channel on their shoulders for a while now, and they have been doing a lot of good for the channel. <laughs> I'm not, not even joking. Like, these guys have been giving a lot of money to us, and it's helping fund the VAs, fund the art, all that fun stuff. Next up is the E4 Mafia. These guys give $25 a month. That's the Great Baguette, Sonic Arrow, Splug the Goblin, Snitty Enjoyer, Dark Side, Kiwi Bastard, Lacune, Josh Beatty, Matty Boy, and Crusader 0625. And of course, there's the Snuffy Squad. These guys give $5 per month. That's El Rock. Chromin, Karina Kestrel, Henry DM, Dalek, Jules, Blonde Lore Lord, Thrace Vega, Devin, Sean Holtz, Andrew N. Gill, Yeti Potato, Skelters, Kite Zero, Classy Cthulhu, Ranger Uninspired, Diesel Dog, Copy Commander, Anto, Inquisitor Matt, Duncan D., and Ian DeLorne Smith. And until we see you next time on this side of the veil, that was Haley, that was Simba. That was Techno Ward, that was Rue, that was Fire, and this is Garbro's Field Desk. We'll see you next time.